Hey, hey, it's TDA and welcome back to Old Worlds. If you're still here in episode 8, you are already awesome. So I highly thank you for being here and uh, enduring my little Old World playthrough because I'm having a lot of fun with that and I'm hoping you have a lot of fun with that as well. Last time around, I promised you a little bit of insight on how to plan out your city-states or your, your cities, I should say. So let's dive into that right away. It basically comes down to planning out districts. If you're familiar with other games like Humankind and Civilization, you, you might already kind of know the concept. Um, but it also applies to Old World, maybe even um, more importantly so than in some of the other games. But it's definitely something you can turn to your favor. So districts are kind of the idea of having certain sections around your city dedicated to a specific type of resource production or a specific type of buildings and they do really um, tie into each other a very a simple example is actually over here i've built this triangle of mines and mines actually get an adjacency bonus so you get a small bonus from a mine being next to another mine um, as you can see we have a production of 13.5 13.5 and 9 over here the only reason this is only 9 is because there's not a specialist in here and these two mines do have a specialist um, but without these mines being next to each other so if i would i i would have built them completely separate from each other and um, they would actually be producing uh, almost three i think even more than three actually four or uh iron ore per, per year less than they are currently doing because they are next to each other so that's a huge bonus that's almost an entire free mine on top of the three that i already have in terms of the production very similar over here, but slightly different is the quarries I've built in my main capital. Um, they get an adjacency bonus from being next to mountains, so that makes sense. But because I've been building them next to mountains, I've also been building them next to each other. And then they get a buff not just from the mountains, but also from being side by side. Now you do have to be careful, just don't slam these uh, just side by side just because. And this is a very good example over here. Um, the reason that this is by itself is because there's three mountains over here, whereas if I would have built it over here, it would have been next to the other mine, or built it over here, it would have been next to two mines, but the bonus that it actually gets from being next to three mountains is larger than from being next to two mines. So that is also something to keep in mind when you're building this. Um, another very similar but slightly different, again, example over here. We have these two mines over here, but we also have this shrine over here, the Shrine of Atar. And it actually buffs nearby mines. So since I've been building two mines anyway uh, on these hills over here to get a pretty decent production of iron, putting down this shrine next to those is going to not just buff my um, culture production, but also get the mines uh, slightly uh, buffed compared to without that shrine. So. It's all about kind of um, figuring out what you're going to build anyway and then trying to optimize the location of your buildings. Same over here. Having pastures and farms next to each other is very beneficial. And let's see, do I have any other examples of this? Well, yeah, um, again, a mine and a shrine next to each other. The specific shrine, of course, that's going to buff that. And uh, yeah, I, I guess you kind of get the point. Now, when it comes to urban developments, it's actually more important even to do this because, for example, hamlets um, get a buff from being adjacent to Odeons and Baths. So if you are going to be building at least probably two hamlets per city, even um, just with one culture upgrade, you would already be able to build two of them per city. Um, building these next to each other doesn't necessarily do anything. But then if you build a bath on one side and a Odeon on the other side, you're already getting two buffs to both these hamlets. Now, of course, the hamlets are going to grow into towns, which produce even more money. So making that be buffed by 20 or 40% is a huge buff. I get 40% on two hamlets. It's basically the third hamlet almost for free. Um, similarly, we have this special unit that I built at the end of my last episode, and that is the Disciple. Now, the Disciples are actually able to build religious buildings and they kind of tie together as well. So first of all, you're going to start with a monastery, which is just a very nice uh, building to have. If you can build it again next to a grove class improvement, um, that's going to be very beneficial. But even if you, if you don't, think about where you're going to be placing it. Because once you're good to go with building temples, you're going to want ideally to build that temple next to your monastery. And then in turn, once you're 
ready to start building your cathedrals, you're going to want to build your cathedral next to your temples. Actually, I think you actually need to build them next to your temple, so you need to make sure you have room for that. Um, so basically, you want these three buildings to be kind of like in another triangle shape next to each other. If you do that, you're going to get a huge cultural center for your city. Um, as you can see, the, the benefits you get from these buildings is pretty large. And that is actually because I am building these uh, disciples now in my clerics city. Uh, they get double um, benefits from monastery and temples. And that's huge because as you can see, one monastery is actually going to get me four science per turn. And normally that would be only one. Similarly, the Jewish temples become ridiculously powerful because these, this six culture, as well as the uh, one order, is a very, very strong bonus to get just from building one single building for 60 um, stone and then just an upkeep of two stone per turn. That's nothing in terms of the value we're going to get back from that. Speaking about planning out cities, um, we're still working towards getting these five developing cities uh, up and running. We have three of them down. We have one more that we're certain that's actually going to reach that threshold. But the fifth one is supposed to be this city. And last time I kept saying, well, I think we're going to cut it very close, but we should probably be able to make it. Now, I've actually done the math. Um, and it really came down to the fact that this already has one culture per turn from the, uh, the honey over here. That will actually allow us to make the threshold. Because that, by default, we have those 20 turns to go. Uh, it would actually give us 20 culture. But we're also going to be building the Odeon over here. And it's almost done. Which is going to give us a huge amount of um, culture per turn. I think it's 3 or 4. I, I, I keep forgetting it's 3. That's going to be there for about 14 turns. I'm not entirely sure if you still get the count of culture on the last turn when this hits zero just before or after this this goes away i'm, I'm not entirely sure so i just uh, in my calculations played safe and assume i have one less turn than that um, and based on that we are going to reach uh, i think it was 97 culture just before the threshold but then we're going to be saved by the fact that we are building uh, one more shrine over here because we have the odian the shrine and the festival as well as the honey culture that's already in here and then this, uh, this worker over here is going to be building another shrine. And that should be sufficient then to push us to about 110 culture by the end of the 16 years. And that, of course, will mean that we have more than enough because we only need 100, as you can tell. Uh, only 100 to get to the developing stage. So that means we have this ambition up and running as well. And then all we need to do for now is, well, of course, keep developing our cities, keep expanding... Um, we're going to take this location next just because it's so close anyway and we're already fighting with these Danes. We have some barbarians incoming so we should be working well towards that 15 military units that we need to kill. And once this, this city is down we can actually try and explore a little bit more in this direction. I'm a little worried about Carthage over here because they have been expanding quite aggressively in my direction. But they actually have like one, two, three at least locations uh, available to them that we know of. Although I'm kind of hoping actually that Assyria might grab a couple of those as well. On the bright side, we have been making peace with both Assyria as well as Carthage as well as Hatti. We are still at the truce with Rome. So to be honest, if we're going to pick a war, we are probably going to start with Rome because they are kind of in this corner down here. We can make sure we have our backs covered basically and then if, if we're ever going to fight a war with a cartage then we are going to go in uh, that direction with our backs fully covered we, we only have to worry about fighting a war on one front because of course it's not unlikely that if we would declare war with cartage then the rome thinks like hey, well if you're going to send your armies to the north i'll just do the same and basically walk in the, the back door um so yeah Last thing I also want to focus on at some point, although we are not really capable of doing so for the moment, is actually exploring in this, this direction. Because we have this whole, almost a quarter of the map, still um, unclear what, what's over here. There might actually be a nation here. Um, and if not, there's going to be a lot of land, or ocean potentially, to explore. And either way, it's going to be nice to know what's there, so we can determine whether or not we should focus on exploring there and potentially uh, expanding in that direction as well. I'm also thinking that we should probably go for aristocracy so we can get an ambassador assigned 
It's going to help us with, well, a lot of stuff, honestly. Um, and then, to be honest, the navigation sounds really tempting as well. And we could pick up some of the all the easy technologies because right now we're producing an insane amount of science compared to what we've been doing before um, to get that out of the way and just have access to a couple of more options in terms of uh, further improving our economy. But I think this is a solid first pick just because the ambassador gives a lot of value and we could actually look into maybe um, getting another law going as well. We also have a new religion in our cities and that's actually the third one. So we have the paganists, we have Judaist, Judaism and then we have, I'm going to butcher this probably, Zoro Zoroastrianism? Zoroastrianism? Something like that. Anyway, the Zoros. Let's call them the Zoros. Um, and we can either make them very happy with us or very unhappy with us, depending on what we do about the fact that not everyone else from the other religions likes them uh, as well. Um, I'm actually inclined to kind of see if we can juggle all of these religions in our cities. You can just see, uh, take action to curb the spread. That will actually mean that you have less religious people in your cities. That could in the long run be a good thing. But in the short run, that means that everyone who is following this religion um, becomes angry at us and that has its own problems that I don't really want to deal with at this point. So again, you can take a different route if that's what you that you want to do. But just make sure that you're able to take down these rebels if they pop up. I'm going to go for this option. And then what I'm go also going to do, because this will make these two religions very happy with me, I'm going to go approach the leader of the paganists and influence him. This will cost me two actions as well as 200 gold. But that will actually mean that he will like me a little bit better. And that should help us towards making sure we don't anger the paganists even further. We also now have the technology to set an ambassador, which could help us with a lot of different things. But right now, the only ambassadors that we have available are these three, as well as our general. But she's doing a pretty good job at leading our armies at the moment. So what we're going to do is probably pick our own queen as our ambassador. It seems fitting. Um, but what we could also do by doing this is making sure that we have all the foreign countries really happy with us. Now, ideally, I would want one that also boosts the religious opinion, uh, but this guy doesn't really do the trick, and he also will give us in the minus to all the foreign countries. So 45 is a pretty hefty bonus, and she will also start gaining experience, and that will hopefully allow us to get upgrade her even further in the long run. Oh, look at the cute little baby. We have a new heir. We get an interesting decision to go along with that because we can kind of um, have a prophecy be foretold about her and that will allow her to become cursed, blessed or divine. Um, whether or not that's actually a good thing depends on the, the thing that we get. Uh, or we can just not risk it and ignore the fool and toss him back in the street. But what would be the fun of that? So our first monastery is done. And I'm actually thinking that we should take advantage of this disciple even further. What we haven't done so far is actually select a state religion. And we have two choices now. But Judaism makes the most sense because we currently have it, I believe, in every city. Let's check. One, two, three, four. Hasn't spread here yet. Um... Or here, but at least we have it in four different cities already, and it should be fairly easy to spread it further if we build a couple more of these disciples. Um, but what we can do is once we adopt it, we will get a discontent reduction in each of these cities, so that's a nice little bonus. We'll also pay one civic per year, so that's that's a negative. But what it will actually allow us to do is uh, not only get a lot more uh, happy Jewish, uh, Jewish people in our cities. But we also get these options enabled from our disciple. Now you can actually consume the unit. It also costs 200 civics in order to activate one of these options. But basically what this does, it upgrades your monasteries, your shrines in this case. Well, let, let's go through it because they have different effects. So if we establish a methodology, um, we increase the chance of Judaism spreading. So that's a good thing. More cities with Judaism, the better. Um, but we'll, we're also going to buff our shrines, and we have a lot of those. And they will each produce two additional cultures. That's huge. Um, we'll also get an additional four culture from our monastery, so that's nice. And we're going to build more of those, most likely. 
Uh, but we're also going to get an opinion bonus from polytheism, which we currently have. So that's all going to be pretty great. Um, veneration is uh, more the monetary version of this, so we get less rebels, but we also get more money from monasteries. This could add up quite a bit if we have more of these, but for now I don't think this is the most interesting one. And then last uh, we have legalism, which is basically um, a little bit more hard to... to initially think about what this is this actually going to do for you because this reduces the upkeep of each of our cities now if you look at what we're spending in terms of upkeep that's actually quite a lot um, and some of our biggest cities actually have a pretty decent upkeep so it's, it's an alternate way of getting more uh, money um, and also more civics from our monastery but right now i think the mythology is definitely the best option simply because it doesn't only buff our monasteries but we also get the huge two plus culture for each of our shrines and we have a, a lot of those i think by now we have like seven or eight of these so this is going to be uh, very useful straight away and of course the monastery that we just built is going to benefit from this as well and what doesn't hurt is that doing things like this also gives you some um, points in the background, get us some more titles, and right now we are now known as the Devout. We actually got the Warrior title as well, just because we defeated quite a few units while fighting over at the tribe camp. And as you can see, we're already up to 106 um, um, legitimacy, and we're going to need all of that because we're spending so much orders moving around units, moving around workers. Our empire is slowly growing bigger and bigger, and you are going to need every order you can get in order to make sure you can actually do all the things you need to do. Well, this was not the outcome we were hoping for, because our little princess is apparently cursed. Um, it's going to be interesting to find out what the result of that is going to be. But I guess we are going to find that out in the next episode because we've already covered a lot of new things in this one. And apparently we're also going to talk about borrowing and the rest next time. So if you're still here, I hope you enjoyed this one and I will catch you in the next one.